Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining um, the launch of the UK Advanced Therapies that will be followed um, with a panel discussion on the next challenges in advanced therapy clinical trials. Um, just before we start, I would like to share just some housekeeping rules. If you please uh, mute yourself and have your camera switched uh, off if you are not speaking. Of course, if you are speaking, please put your camera on and, and of course the microphone. Um, we, the discussions, um, so the presentations will be followed by the discussions, and then you will have the opportunity to um, ask any questions. We will uh, hold a Q&A session. I would ask everybody to put their questions in the chat and we will um, go through them. If by, um, by any chance we don't have time to answer all the questions, um, I will send these to the, uh, to the panel uh, members and uh, they will come back to you um, via email as well. Um, we will be sharing the recording with all the registered attendees and uh, I will send you the slides for the presentations as well. And now I would like to hand over really to my, um, my colleague um, Francesca Grubik, who is the um, director of the UKAT. Thank you, Katrina. And uh, the first thing I would like to say is uh, thank you to you and the Olmed City team that organized uh, this meeting. Uh, we thought it was uh, complicated uh, enough to uh, run a London-wide uh, series of events, but uh, uh, fitting the diary and organizing a UK-wide has been a tremendous effort. Uh, I will just spend a few, a few minutes to say how the story behind this network, how we went from London Advanced Therapies to, um, in 2018, to a, a UK-wide uh, confederation of networks. So as I say, London Advanced Therapies was funded in, was uh, started in um, late 2018, early 2019. Um, and it really had the aim of bringing together the academic community in London working in the field of cell and gene-based therapies with the long-term aim of making, let's say the UK, the go-to place for collaboration both for academic and commercial collaboration and keeping our competitive edge over uh, the rest of the world. And uh, in order to do that, we uh, launched a series of activities. We received funding from Research England and we are very grateful for it. And we thought that a series of different activities to be run together would be the best way to consolidate uh, and create and consolidate a truly collaborative ethos. So first, uh, we launched the Advanced Therapies Network, and uh, uh, which you know is is runs events like this. So those are a series of seminars with networking opportunities. And uh, at the launch in 2018, we were very happy that we had 250 uh, people registered, and uh, now we we exceed the 800 as number. And uh, we have people from commercial companies, uh, big pharma, SMEs, uh, trust and NHS Trust and universities. And the inter interesting bit is that uh, both uh, researchers and professional service uh, um, um, uh, join our meeting. So it, it's really a place to go where to, to network in this field. Uh, we created a series of educational packages under the leadership of Professor Ruta Briggriesenbach, who's here with us and will join the panel meeting later on. Uh, we launched some uh, funding initiatives, both for uh, collaborating to innovate is the fund that uh, supports collaborative effort between SMEs and the universities, while confidence in collaboration was uh, to support uh, projects uh, between two different universities. And we really put a lot of attention to ensure that these were new collaboration, people that had not worked before. We also performed a, run a series of activities that we clustered as enterprise accelerators that really aim at making it easier to work with London. So we map expertise, we created contracts that would be a good starting point for negotiation, uh, for collaborative uh, efforts, and, uh, and uh, we really create a network of a relationship within, with the professional services across the university and develop in this way some uh, good practice. So just to give you a visual of what we have done in London, uh, sorry, the 
yes, this is coming up. These are the, every, each of these lines is a collaboration we uh, funded across the four universities and some project even involved three universities. And uh, this is the uh, map of uh, uh, project between um, SMEs and uh, at the universities. So you can see we, we, we initiate the project, we helped the companies to find the ideal partner in the uh, university with the right expertise and we helped negotiate the contracts, aiming really at improving the process while doing so. And we had later on some good indication of how uh, that, that was a successful um, endeavor. Uh, early in 2018, I mean, of course, we realized how important collaboration is. This is the whole concept of this initiative. Uh, but we started um, working with uh, other colleagues across the UK. Uh, so we established link with uh, Edinburgh, with Glasgow, with uh, the Scottish Enterprises. And then we um, visited uh, Sheffield, I remember, in late 2018. And we started reaching out uh, on, to other universities and the other partners across. Sorry if I um, make silly faces, but the, the screens it doesn't seem to be moving. <laughs> Here they are, they're all appearing. So um, in 2019 and 2018, we really started building what we, uh, we call the UK Advanced Therapies Collaborative with really the dream. This I remember presenting this slide as a, as a vision going forward. We really should work on uh, establishing a collaborative network. And uh, that worked well for us because we were very ready to respond to a call from Research England who offered um, us additional funds uh, to create a UK-wide network. And with their help, we managed to, we established the UK Advanced Therapies. And uh, so, which is a confederation of uh, uh, network as we call them. Um, all the partners that I showed before, the different universities and their networking partners came together to create Northern Ireland Advanced Therapies, Scotland Advanced Therapies, Northern Advanced Therapies, South West Advanced Therapies. And um, it's been a fantastic initiative. Um, we then decided to run exactly the same activities. We funded projects, we will create uh, educational uh, packages. And this is just a little snapshot of the project that we managed already to fund. Sorry, the, the slides has gone away with me, uh, probably telling me I've been speaking for too long. And the only thing I wanted to add that um, we had a record breaking contract closure time. It took us two weeks for one of those contracts to be negotiated. So we were quite uh, proud about it. And in my next slides, I, I should be presenting, uh, going forward, I will should not present the next speaker, which uh, is uh, Northern Ireland, but in a truly collaborative style, I'm gonna present on their behalf because they, they uh, last minute, they couldn't be here today. And uh, so I will do a little bit of intro for uh, how our colleagues at the Northern Ireland Advanced Therapies and the Health Inno Innovation Research Alliance, Northern Ireland. Um, I will say a few words and then I pass over to a colleague that uh, will speak about a project she's uh, um, directing. So Northern Ireland Advanced Therapies Cluster was formed in late 2020 and uh, we uh, as London Advanced Therapies work closely with them to um, help them shaping it. And uh, while doing so, when we reached out to uh, Alice's colleague and Aster and, and Queens, we realized that this is a real thriving um, environment. So there, there are many activities in Northern Ireland um, within the two universities, five NHS Trust, uh, and uh, with more than 300 firms residing there. And uh, I'll just say a few words, and I have to say I apologize to all my colleagues. I will never be as good as they would have been in presenting the, um, the wealth of, of uh, opportunities and work that is performed there. Sorry, I clicked uh, fa too fast. Um, let's see if I can go back one slide. Uh, Professor Tara Moore from Halster, uh, she's, um, working in novel delivery technologies and she has collaboration with Avellino and she contributed to founding CSAF. Professor Ellen McCarthy is the founder of Fion Therapeutics and uh, uh, in now the next slides 
And uh, Vask Versa is another uh, spin out from Queens in Belfast. I will now call my colleague to speak about the realist trial. Hi, thanks, Francesca. Um, I hope that I am now sharing on the screen as well. Uh, my name is Ellen Gorman. I'm, I'm pre uh, presenting very briefly on the Realist trial on behalf of um, Professor Macaulay. Um, and just to give you some insight into the cell therapy work that we have going on um, within Northern Ireland and within Queen's University at the moment. The Realist trial is a multi-centre phase one and followed by a phase two trial with phase one being an open navel dose escalation and a phase two randomised control trial in mechanically ventilated patients with um, with um, um, acute respiratory distress syndrome and latterly since uh, the um, outset of the COVID-19 pandemic we've also recruited a cohort of patients with ARGE due to with ARGE due to COVID-19. Um, this trial is investigating a novel cellular therapy um, of um, a cryopreserved allogeneic CD362 enriched uh, product um, which is administered to critically ill patients in intensive care. And the trial aimed to investigate the safety and efficacy of a single intravenous infusion of realist orbital C in patients with acute respiratory distress, distress syndrome. Uh, to illustrate our progress on this trial, uh, we have now completed a phase one, one um, trial, um, and I'll give an overview of the timeline of that on the next slide. And also our phase two COVID trial has completed. We, we have recently published the results of the phase one, and we hope to publish the results of the phase two soon. And we do then have an ongoing uh, phase two trial and patients that have acute respiratory dis distress syndrome that's on related to um, COVID-19. So next slide, please. I think the control is back with uh, Katarina. Thank you, Katarina. So uh, just to illustrate, as I said, this is a multi-centre trial, so it is being led by Queen's University. It's sponsored by the Belfast Health um, and Social Care uh, Trust, but um, it is a, a multi-centre trial being delivered across the UK. Our manufacturers of the, the novel cellular product are NHSBT, um, in, uh, mainly at the Birmingham site, and also recently we've branched into their Liverpool site. You can see in, in the graph in the middle, those are the cell therapy facilities that we are utilising across the UK, and the, the cellular product is de delivered to those cryopreserved ready for delivery to patients when they're identified at the clinical sites and, and so far we have 13 clinical sites involved. Next slide. <clears throat> so um, this is um, a, a brief overview of the timeline of the phase one trial that it spans from 2000 2021 um, illustrates the potential challenges there are in the delivery of a cell therapy trial but thankfully on the next slide I'll show you um, phase two did progress much quicker than this so the funding was initially identified for this trial back in 2015 and following the relevant approvals the trial um, opened to recruitment in, in January 2019. It was a safety trial and um, there were um, cohorts of three patients recruited um, one, one patient at a time to several different um, doses um, and in between each dose cohort, there was a pause for a uh, um, safety monitoring committee to make sure that there were no safety issues identified. So if you could just click um, the following, if you could just give it a couple of clicks and it'll bring the animations up um, and I'll, I'll talk through those. So I just wanted to highlight um, one, of the, the, one of the challenges that we had during this phase one study um, that resulted in a, a pause to trial recruitment between May and September 2019. And we've labelled this as the particulate matter issue. Um, and what happened was the cryopreserved product, um, uh, when it was being thawed, um, it was identified that there was um, the, the presence of some particular matter in the infusion bag um, and there was a series of multidisciplinary investigations um, I eventually come into the conclusion that this particular matter was expected for a cellular product um, and following those investigations um, and various risk assessments um, and applications to restart the trial one of the conclusions was that there was a need for multidisciplinary education because for people familiar working with cellular products and um, this um, level of particular matter in the infusions appeared to be normal but for those that who were unfamiliar with previously working with cellular products and um, this did, wasn't exactly as described in our um, in our um, trial paperwork and so did raise uh, rightfully raise concern that required investigation um, and I think highlights the need for um, multidisciplinary communication and, ed and education going forward in the field of cellular therapy. 
Thankfully, we were able to move on from that and eventually we completed recruitment to the phase one trial in um, January 2020. Um, and if you click on to my next slide, I'll, I can briefly show you then. So we were ready then to open the phase two in, um, in March um, 2020. Um, and as we, we all know, um, at that stage, COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. And given the similarities um, in underlying um, similarities um, in acute respiratory distress syndrome we were seeing in COVID-19 patients with the population we had planned to recruit, we saw the opportunity to repurpose this trial to recruit a cohort of patients with ARDS due to COVID-19. Um, you can see then from the timeline, um, things progressed extremely quickly. We were able to update our protocol, obtain additional, additional funding, um, get our NHRA approvals um, and NIHR um, urging public health status um, within a matter of weeks from first deciding to repurpose the trial and subsequently having our, um, our first patient recruited within two weeks. So I think that that really does illustrate um, the strides forward we've seen, seen in um, research, even in the setting of the pandemic. We, if you see then on the bottom left, you can see our recruitment over the period of the following nine months. And this, this did follow the trends that we saw in COVID-19 hospital admissions and ICU admissions generally. So we did have a lull over the summer before our recruitment to the phase two study picked up again over the second wave of COVID-19. And we did then recruit the 60 patients to the, to the study as planned. Um, so um, with that, I'd just like to thank all of the, the, the many collaborators involved in delivering of this trial, um, and um, I hope that um, we will be able to share the results of the trial um, with you and, and generally um, with it being published in the, in the not too distant future. Um, and with that, I'll hand back over to um, Francesca. Thank you so much. And I'm um, uh, just here now to introduce our next speaker, which is Professor Moin Salem, uh, pediatric neurophrologist from uh, Bristol Children's Hospital, who will talk to us about the Southwestern Advanced Therapies Network. Great. Um, thanks, Francesca. Um, so um, I'm a, I'm a, a nephrologist, um, but here I want to sort of highlight to you how the Southwest is a really dynamic environment at the moment. and particularly emphasizing significant funding that's come into cell and gene therapy and advanced therapies into the Southwest recently. So the, the, the really positive trajectory that we're on. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is a, a committee and the committee um, uh, represents um, SMEs, industry and NHS stakeholders. And the objective is to make, make connections within the region, profile our strengths in advanced therapy, but also um, make connections nationwide, um, particularly with this network. Uh, next slide. So I'm gonna highlight um, both the university, from the university academic perspectives and also some of the companies that um, are in the Southwest. So this um, is the University of Bristol and some of the, the sort of world, our, our strengths are built on some of the world leading um, groups that we have here. Um, I don't want to, I could spend my whole five minutes on my own um, uh, area of nephrology, but we have just to sort of quickly highlight um, that we have um, uh, a big um, sort of world leading renal uh, disease group in Bristol. And we spun out Pure Spring Therapeutics, which is um, a 45 million pound series A spin out for gene therapy, the first re renal gene therapy company. And we had our first birthday yesterday um, of the company. Um, in the ophthalmology field, there are um, again, preclinical programs across a number of indications and, and moving beyond monogenic diseases. The Bristol Heart Institute is world renowned and they work on tissue engineered project products, cell and gene therapies, etc. Um, in adult and pediatrics. Um, similarly, Bristol Neuroscience is very well established with a fantastic reputation um, and work on uh, neurological conditions, including um, MS and Friedrichs. And then the Translational Biomedical Research Center is our large animal facility and is actually the largest or the biggest large animal facil facility within a UK university. So really fantastic setup. And then there's Brist Bristol Bio, Bristol Biodesign, another strength in synthetic biology in, uh, in, within the university. Uh, next slide. So let's start to highlight um, some of our um, strengths. So Cy Cytoseek is a company that's um, built a spin out from Bristol University to commercialize artificial membrane binding proteins and applying these to, to um, functionally to cell therapies 
um, immune cell therapies. And there's a pipeline of, um, of these um, binding proteins currently in preclinical proof of concept studies. And they've been successful in funding so far with a seed round um, raising almost 5 million to date. Next slide. Um, NHS blood and transplant in Filton is very active. Um, their advanced therapy unit is very experienced in cell transduction, expansion, cell selection. Um, they're involved in at least five uh, clinical trials that are supported by NHS BT um, currently. Um, and they also have a, a clinical biotechnology center, which is relocating next year to Filton, and that'll manufacture GMP grade plasma DNA recombinant protein viral vectors and so on. Um, and then um, very encouragingly, um, there's been funding very recently um, uh, 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 gained from MRC LifeArc for a gene therapy innovation hub. This is one of three facilities um, that have been created and, and will enable um, NHS BT at Filton to, um, to, to help academic researchers progressing gene therapy research or offering GMP facilities for trials, materials, translational support, regulatory advice, and so on. So, so um, that's a, a real sort of success that's building on Bristol Academia. And then finally, Exmoor. Exmoor um, is a biomanufacturing company. Um, they raised 12 million pounds of capital in March this year. Um, they provide end-to-end -end support for translating cell and gene therapies. Um, they have consultancy um, roles, um, designing manufacturing facilities globally, um, large labs um, that are um, dedicated to cell and gene therapy process development, um, and a new Bristol facility, a, a, a huge one that's going to bring expanded process development and GMP manufacturing um, in 2023. So they're increasing their staff and on a very positive trajectory. Next slide. Um, so that's my sort of quick roundup. Um, there's a, the, the, just to advertise the next event, which will be a hybrid in-person event, um, hybrid and in-person event, um, and um, a theme of a kind of roadmap of concept to clinic, and that's going to be in March this year. So um, thank you for uh, listening, and I'll pass you on to the next speaker, which I think is Helen Cole. Thank you, Professor Salim. Uh, excellent presentation. And I'll move on now and describe the Northern Advanced Therapies approach. Um, it will be a little different. I'm not a clinician nor an academic. I am industry partnerships manager and a medical physicist by background. But what we do at the Northern Health Science Alliance is essentially facilitate a network amongst our members. Next slide, please. So we are predominantly a membership organisation. We represent 10 research active universities and 10 NHS trusts across the north of England, ranging from Sheffield up to the Scottish borders, a 16 million population of citizens, and also all four of the academic health science networks in the north of England. And that's just some of their facts and figures there to give you a sense of the scale of our life science cluster in the north. Thanks, thank you. We are also funded at the moment in partnership with MedCity by UKRI Research England as part of their Red Research England Development Fund. So it is different to this particular funding stream that Francesca and London Advanced Therapies have uh, secured for UKAT. And in this programme, we have, sorry, if you can go back, thank you. In this programme, we have some work streams for Research England around national and international visibility, industry engagement, cluster development and advocacy work. And it's across six programmes of strength in the north of England. You see, you can see there advanced therapies being the first, also diagnostics and medtech, data and AI, mental health, health inequalities and healthy ageing. Thank you. So if we focus now on the advanced therapies in particular, so the NHSA had begun around 2019 in bringing our members together and creating a network. This is the way we work across all of our programmes. We connect the clinical and the academics to meet regularly quarterly basis, look for opportunities for uh, pan-northern scale funding for uh, both projects in R&D and other areas that will help with economic growth in the north as a life science cluster. So in particular for the Advanced Therapies Network, as time moved on through to 2020, it was felt by the group that they would like a terms of reference, and this is essentially what we set ourselves out to do. So we're bringing together the academic, clinical and industry experts and ATMPs to coordinate their activities and facilitate northern uh, knowledge sharing. 
we're a northern UK network of networks. It really is important to emphasise that because the interests represented are from bench to bedside in ATMP discovery, clinical research for our university settings, through translational development in our NHS settings and into clinical evaluation and adoption and spread in the NHS because we do have members of the Advanced Therapies Treatment Centres in our network, both IMATCH and the Northern Alliance. And as a result, that's brought us very close alliance and connection with Scotland Advanced Therapies through the existing collaborations there. We also aim to improve the visibility of the members with policymakers, DIT, NOCRI and industry, both within the UK and internationally. And as I mentioned, looking to seek significant funding opportunities that require collaboration at scale. Our members are very good and have their own industry relationships and partnerships and projects, um, which we hope to showcase in the future regional roadshow for the North. Um, but anything that is at scale and pan northern, that's where we get into, involved in facilitating and helping with that. And lastly, it's to support the place-based initiatives emerging from the network. As Professor Celine described, there is the MRC Life Art funding and there is the, uh, the GTIMC, the Gene Therapy Innovation and Manufacturing Centre based out of Sheffield, which is reaching out to others in the north as well, such as uh, bringing iMatch in and on board to promote fast progress of advanced therapies, which benefits patients and commercialization across the North and the UK as a whole. Thank you. Our membership, just in brief picture. So to the left are core members of the Northern Health Science Alliance. And this was very much instigated even before the London Advanced Therapies approach to set up UK Advanced Therapies by Professor Mamoun Azouz of the Sheffield University. So under his leadership and direction, you know, we brought these people together from our membership, a number of clinical and academic leaders in advanced therapies. And he's our chair currently, but with the plan to rotate that chair amongst the members. And then on the right, we've got their strategic partners through the uh, various uh, ATTCs, in essence. And, you know, word has spread. There are more people wanting to be involved. So we've got new members highlighted there, University of Glasgow, Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS. And also most recently joining the meeting next week, we've got the National Horizon Centre out of Teesside University and CPI are going to be getting on board and getting involved in the networking work we do. Next slide, please. In terms of outputs, we undertook an asset mapping exercise. One of the first things we did last year with the support of the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult. Now that's far too busy to go into in any detail, but will be available for you to look at afterwards in the slide deck. And what we really wanted to achieve was a picture of a common pathway or landscape that ATMP developers would need to access if they're looking to partner and get uh, clinical and academic partnerships for funding uh, projects and so on. So down the side there, we've got the different stages of the pathway, so from discovery through to adoption and spread, as mentioned. We've got the areas our R&D and universities could help with. We've got the areas the NHS through the Advanced Therapy Treatment Centre could help with. Early and late stage manufacturing, regulatory and the enablers. So what we did was through the mapping place, essentially through a survey, the each of our members and each of their strategic partners and where they could facilitate a university, uh, sorry, an industry partnership in any projects requiring these facilities and skills and expertise. Thank you. Next slide, please. So just to pick one element of that asset mapping out, this represents both our northern and in fact the Scotland advanced therapies, clinical research interests. As you can see, they're vast. Not being a clinician, I won't attempt to pronounce any of these, but again, you could take a look at them in the slide deck afterwards. Thank you. And lastly, well, a key part of the role of the NHSA is in advocacy. So one large piece of work we did in the last year, 2020, and again in 2021, was prepare a proposition for representation to the government through the Comprehensive Spending Review. So we'd create Connected Health North, which has uh, propositions in each of our work programmes and for advanced therapies, it's working with industry, identifying their needs. And it was very much what industry needs in terms of capacity and capability to catalyze the development, evaluation, manufacturing, and clinical delivery of industry-led innovation from lab to bedside for those cutting edge cell and gene therapies. So uh, it also extended into a piece of work with the Northern Powerhouse LEPS, the local enterprise partnerships. And we published this shared statement on life science market and opportunities in the North of England. 
So as a result, from now onwards, we're looking really towards the uh, levelling up as an outcome of the comprehensive spending review and autumn budget to see whether any of these propositions will be supported through calls for funding through OLS and BAYS, for example. And lastly, in planning, we've got promotional materials, case studies, and we're preparing for the UK Advanced Therapies Regional Roadshows in 2022 with Scotland Advanced Therapies. And that's the opportunity at which our clinical and academic colleagues can really showcase the specific projects they've been working on. I think there may be one more slide. Yeah, it was really just to give a, an acknowledgement and a vote of thanks to Francesca for all the work she and Little Advanced Therapies colleagues put into this. We're delighted to be part of the founding of UK Advanced Therapies and very much look forward to a successful future for UK PLC. Thank you. I think next it's handing on to uh, Dr Ali Dunn, who's going to speak about the Scotland Advanced Therapies in particular. Thank you. I will just share my screen. And thank you very much, Helen. And yes, very much looking forward to um, working across the network. So I'm Ali, I'm the Executive Director for SALSA, which is the Scottish University's Life Sciences Alliance. Um, we are one of 10 research pools in Scotland and we drive collaboration across the universities. We have 11 members um, and we're about driving collaboration also across sectors and across disciplines to support high quality and often translational research. So today, a lot of the work that I'm going to um, talk about very quickly um, stems from the Industry Leadership Group for Life Sciences in Scotland. This is a group that is chaired by co-chaired by David Tudor from CPI and Ivan McKee, who is an MSP um, here in Scotland. Um, and it comes from a subgroup, which we are part of alongside Skills Development Scotland and Scottish Enterprise. And I think what that shows you really is that we are um, very much about the Pan-Scotland approach and we bring in the level of skills as well as research and also industry. We are in the um, very early stages of our network and not as well formed as some of the others. Um, so, but what I wanted to do, to do today was just to give you a brief overview of kind of where the Scottish landscape sits currently. Um, so, we have a very well established infrastructure and GMP translational, translational expertise. With Scotland's hub of activity in Edinburgh, a very strong reputation in translational research across Scotland, and of course being part of the Northern Alliance Advanced Therapy Treatment Centres um, and close, close relationship with the NHSA. Um, we're really experienced and passionate about working collaboratively across the UK and also internationally. We also have a strong reputation in spin-out formation. Some recent examples of those are phenotherapeutics, which are developing remyelinating therapies for multiple sclerosis. Salinsha, which is focused on targeting cancer stem cells with highly selective gene therapy. Resolution therapeutics, which is developing macrophage technology to treat inflammatory organ disease. And the three of these collectively in the last 12 months have secured 40 million between them. We also have technical expertise in the viral vectors um, with spin-out companies such as Sympromics, which was recently acquired and merged into Bayer Bayer. We are in Scotland, as we are across the rest of the UK, seeing great growth in um, the advanced therapies and vaccines field. Um, and in particular in Scotland, significant growth is seen in companies such as Roslyn CT, Symbiosis, SGS, Merck and Valneva. So as a landscape view, you can see the whole supply chain of companies in Scotland that are supporting advanced therapies and vaccines. And a real goal for us is to really try and connect this with our research and also with skills to really try and um, drive this forward. So as I mentioned, we're in really quite early stages. A lot of work has been done and this has really been led by Scottish Enterprise um, uh, to develop a growth plan for Scotland for advanced therapies and vaccines. And this is where we're trying to formalize that more within this network and work more formally across the partners. So there are two major themes in that, translation to clinic and manufacturing. And these are underpinned by key activities, which include funding and commercialization, networking and coordination and skills and training. Um, this information can all be found more on the Life Sciences in Scotland website um, on a dedicated page around advanced therapies and vaccines in Scotland. And you can check that out. The slides will be available afterwards, I believe. Um, some key things to mention. We work very closely with the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult. They obviously um, are now in Edinburgh Biocorder and the University of Edinburgh, which is really exciting for us here in Scotland. 
We were successful um, in securing one of the three advanced therapies, skills and training networks. And that was very much part of a pan Scotland consortia approach. And we're delivering the training across Scotland and really trying to look at the demand led um, training that's needed and how we can support our industry. We also have the advanced therapies apprenticeship community, which is supporting modern apprenticeships in Scotland. Um, so I really have whizzed through, hopefully that helps with time. Um, just a note, we are going to be working with Helen to deliver on our um, uh, part of our part of the roadshow. We're really excited about doing that. There is, um, we are looking to work closely with the uh, European um, stem cell and cell and gene therapy network, which is run out of Edinburgh University. Um, and there is the annual Congress in Edinburgh in 2022, in October. So just a bit of a note for your, for your diaries there. I just want to end, I appreciate that was a bit of a whistle stop tour there, um, uh, but there's a lot more work for us to be doing and we're excited to be doing it. We wanted to say a big thank you to Francesca and the whole team and to Katerina for organizing today's event. Um, and I personally would like to say thank you to Ed Hutchinson, who's really driven this from Scottish Enterprise um, and to the team here in Scotland who have been driving this forward. So I will stop there and thank you very, very much. And I believe we have the panel session coming up now. So thank you, Francesca. And thank you so much for all this very interesting presentation. And I want to echo, yes, Ed Hutchinson was really a driver for me, um, helping me to reach out to all the Scottish university and partners. And uh, now we we'll have the uh, panel session uh, chaired by Jacqueline uh, Berry, who's the clinical, uh, the chief clinical officer at uh, um, the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult. Hi, Jackie, thanks for uh, joining us. And uh, I think uh, you are planning to discuss uh, what are the next challenges in the uh, clinical uptake and uh, why the moment to act is now. <laughs> thanks, Take Francesca. it away. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for uh, having the honour to be uh, chairing this panel. I'm, I'm really really excited by the amount of people that are online. I think the presentations that have just gone ahead have shown the real interest in the country um, nationally and locally for these therapies. And actually, while I was listening to it, I was thinking, I was reflecting back when Catapult started in 2012, we had quite an immature um, cell gene therapy industry in the UK. And now we've got a third of all the companies in Europe are based in the UK. We have a um, uh, 1.7 million pound bill, uh, billion investment over two years in 2018, 2020. Um, it's the second biggest cluster outside of the US. We've got the first um, advanced therapy treatment center network. And so a network working within a healthcare system, the NHS to deliver these therapies. Um, and we've actually got 12% representation of all global clinical trials for ATMPs, which compared with um, normal pharmaceuticals, which is about 3 4%, is showing that we're really active in this space. So that's just a, a summary of where we're at. And I just think it's astonishing and it's so great to be part of it. I was specifically asked to talk about clinical trials and how we get more clinical trials into the NHS. And in particular, for this community, for more of an academic community, what are the barriers? So unfortunately, I'm going to very quickly share some slides. Um, hopefully, if I can just share these. Okay, is that being shared? Can you see my slides? I'm going to guess that you can. Um, we, uh, as part of the Advanced Therapy Treatment Centre Network and Catapult, we, we realised, and actually Robin, who's going to be on the panel, actually sparked this as well, um, that there were specific barriers for clinical trials being driven out of academia. Um, and we thought it would be good to actually investigate that some more. So we did a survey, we did some questionnaires, we did some interviews, and we had a real representation across all of the UK, all of the clinical sites in the UK, talked to the HRA, we talked to the London Advanced Therapies, we talked to uh, research ethic committee members, and we just did a survey. I'm really quickly going to go through this because we haven't got much time. And we saw that there were some key issues, which I'm, I'm not going to talk through all of these because we're, we're limited for time, but they fell into essentially eight buckets. 
infrastructure? Was it being utilised properly? Um, were there enough trained people? And uh, some people mentioned that earlier. Um, were people reinventing the wheel because they were seeing new things? And uh, uh, Ellen talked earlier about people not understanding there would be particularly it matters in these type of products. The governance, there wasn't a clear governance for these. Um, R&D committees didn't know what these products were sometimes. And there was a real lack of clarity between roles and responsibilities between a cell therapy lab, a pharmacy, the, the developers. Resources, lack of trained staff, a uh, shortage of research nurses, problems manufacturing to a suitable grade, um, patient recruitment, how did you identify the patients? How did you recruit them onto your trial? Um, quite often we're in orphan diseases, there was competition for, for patients. Um, and patients and clinicians not being familiar with these products. Lack of education, education of patients, lack of education of uh, the clinical staff, uh, the, the pharmacists, everyone. Um, regulatory and ethics were in a really early stage. Regulatory uh, pathway probably quite new, but quite established now. Um, research ethics committee are the expert in advanced therapies. There's the more expertise and there's a real limited number of them. And financing. Um, grants aren't long enough for people that are in this space, so they, they get they get started, they get nearly to clinical trial, and then the grant runs out. What do you do there? Um, and more investment needed, perhaps by NIHR, uh, by the local trust, to facilitate these trials, because they are complex trials that are multifaceted and need impact, input from so many different uh, quarters. So these were some of the things that we picked up on. I'm now going to go over to the panel discussion. I'll stop sharing. Um, and I'll ask the, the panel members to introduce themselves. Um, I, if you don't mind, I will just call you out um, and you can just introduce yourself very, very briefly. So going through the people that I have on screen, Ellen, you're up at the top. Could you just, you've already introduced yourself. Do you want to add a little bit more um, about yourself just now? Certainly. Um, um, I'm Ellen Gorman. I'm a clinical research fellow working at Queen's University. Um, I'm working with the critical care group um, in, in Queen's, um, focused on clinical trials and the particular trial that I'm working on, as I introduced during the presentation, was the realist trial, among among other um, um, critical care trials as well. Thank you very much. Um, Michaela, you're next on my screen. Hello, I'm uh, Michela Gugliere, I'm a consultant neurologist at the John Walton Muscle Dystrophy uh, Research Centre in Newcastle. Um, I'm involved in um, different clinical trials as a clinical trial lead. They've been involved in the setup of the first gene therapy trial in a pediatric neuromuscular disease. And now we have actually uh, yesterday those a first patient in gene therapy trial for adults with neuromuscular diseases. So that is my area. And I'm involved in the setup of a network of clinical trial sites across the UK, that is the DMD hub. Thanks very much. Victoria, can I come to you now, please? Yeah, thanks. So I'm Victoria Campbell. I'm a consultant hematologist in Scotland, so based at the Western General Hospital. Um, I'm clinical lead for clinical trials, including early phase studies, and clinical lead for the development of a TIMP within NHS Lothian, so trying to bring these A TIMPs, both the gene and cell therapies, actually into the NHS and work closely with uh, NAATTC and recognise quite a few of the people on the panel. So, hi guys. Thanks, Victoria. Robin, you're, you're next to my screen. Hello, I'm, I'm Robin Alley. Um, I head up a new centre for cell and gene therapy at King's College London, and I'm also director of the Guys in St Thomas's Biomedical Research Centre and um, lead the King's um, Royal Free UCL um, Life Arc MRC Gene Innovation Hub. Thank you. Um, Uta, I think you're next on my screen. Hi, everybody. My name is Uta Riesenbach. I'm a professor of molecular medicine at Imperial College and have about 25 years experience in gene therapy development for lung diseases mainly. Um, I'm also a non-executive uh, director of the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult and chair the Pan-UK Working Group for ATMP Workforce Development. Thanks, Suta. And Bishan, you're, you're, you're the final one. <laughs> Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Bijan Modurai. I'm a clinical academic employed by King's College London. I'm a professor of vascular surgery 
and uh, funded by the British Art Foundation as, as their senior fellow. And I've been working with a team of people developing uh, tissue remodeling monocytes as a therapeutic product. Um, and we've, we've taken those to two first demand studies for two different indications, promoting vessel growth in the ischemic limb and treating post COVID lung fibrosis. Pleasure to be here. Fantastic, thank you very much. And Francesco, you're, already, you're also on the panel, but yeah, I don't think you need to introduce yourself any further. So okay. thank you so much um, for, for your introductions. And I think I put up some of the, the, the results that we saw from this uh, survey that we did. Um, but if I can, Robin, I'm gonna to come to you first because you did spark the survey and the, and the interviews. What, what do you think are the biggest barriers for academics going into clinical trials for advanced therapies? Um, I think um, perhaps the biggest barrier is having the critical mass of expertise available for new investigators to transition from uh, preclinical research, from, from um, developing a new therapeutic approach to uh, taking that into a, a academic-led clinical trial. I think it's one thing to do the preclinical research and then license it out, work with a company. But to actually um, embark on that academic-led without prior experience requires that investigator to be embedded in, in, in a, an infrastructure with expertise around, wraparound expertise that can go through all the steps. And I think we can see that emerging, there are well-established centres within the UK that, that have a um, uh, critical mass of investigators who are developing cell therapy, gene therapy trials. And you can see in these centers, there is the, there is the uh, critical mass um, uh, and, and uh, that can support um, new approaches, new therapies, new investigators, investigators, investigators coming through. Because what we have to remember is that advanced therapies is a fast moving field. And, it, and, and, and the engine for this is, is all the preclinical research that's coming out of universities. So, you know, it, it's, it's a dynamic environment so that we need to be able to support uh, new uh, research and, and investigators who haven't been involved in this in the past to, to, to see that research go all the way through. And even for established, in my view, even for established programs, there is now a new uh, issue that's 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 becoming apparent, at least to me, is that you know we we talk about the the the, the and I and I absolutely believe the necessity for and the advantages of spinning out companies from universities to really drive these therapies through to through to um, uh, licensed products and commercialization, but that's creating new pressures, which is that it's taking expertise out. Of the university so we are seeing loss of expertise and loss of continuity so we have to we have to build that into our plans that we are going to have to train more individuals we have to have uh, some sort of uh, redundancy built into our our networks to to um to allow uh, companies spin out companies to 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 um develop and and, and take and inevitably will take trained staff and and, and even some of the academics out of the system. So for yeah. us to maintain a thriving academic environment where we, we, we're seeing academic-led studies um, needs a careful um, support and, and, and of, of, the, of that infrastructure and awareness that it, 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 is, it is inevitably um, linked into a wider system with, with, with industry. And it, it is not, it, and we'll see, increasingly see it is not it is not completely cut off for it cut off from uh, industry it is working in partnership and it, it's going to have to work in a way where where we we acknowledge um the, that that dynamic um interaction okay. and Victoria, can I come to you because you that's very, and I absolutely agree with everything that Robin just said. I think you, you raise an interesting thing about the clinical, the, the, the training and the, the loss of expertise, which I think is a really important thing. Tony, 
you know, you're very much in the clinical space rather than the making the product space. What, what do you think the, the particular challenges that, that, you know, you're helping people get into clinical trial? What do you think the challenges are? Um, so I think it's really interesting and following on from Robin, his exact point was it's, it's, it's rapidly advancing and it's moving very quickly. What we know is the NHS is, it is excited, it wants to bring these things in, but the NHS is very big and it's very clunky and it isn't very fast, so it's quite slow at responding. So. I think it's it's not for a not for a want that the NHS doesn't want to get involved, but these are these are new. There's multi layers involved. I do think it needs to be considered. I know that these sorts of talks you lump together sort of atoms, but actually, when you break it down, gene therapy versus cell therapy are very very different, and actually they need to be when you're coming into the NHS considered very differently, because there's there's different components are required to to both. I think if I could sort of say anything to help with it would be to try and have a more collaborative approach across the UK with these new studies that are coming through so that you try to have more uniformity and not have sort of tiny little differences where you could find that you go into R&D and it will delay things and it takes you six or nine months to get that through because of a tiny little difference. Um, so I think it would be very helpful actually from an earlier stage if researchers were linking in to know what, what the pressures are within the NHS, what NHS does resource wise have available. There's a lot of things that the gene therapies are requiring that in an awful lot of hospitals, we simply don't have. So those sorts of resources are needing to be built in and developed before we can think about delivering the gene therapies. From the cell therapies, they come with different things such as toxicity. So actually you then got to balance it with the pressures within the clinical service because the likelihood is that they are going to have to be cared for by the same sort of clinical team and take over inpatient beds or day case beds that have already got to juggle the, the NHS patients. So I think it's coming together and working in, in close partnership with the NHS. It's not that the NHS doesn't want to do it. It very much does want to do it and to be supportive and to try and turn these through quicker because I think we are very aware that it can hit our R&D department and it can take months and, and, and months and we seem to probably go back and it feels quite challenging. Um, I think the ATTC networks have been fantastic in, in that and starting to have these, these very available documents in terms of for establishing institutional readiness and what is required within the NHS to be able to be taking these on. I think it's important to make sure that we don't keep these therapies just in your big centralised hospitals, so um, Manchester or down in London, and actually remember that there are capacity constraints in the NHS and actually for these things which can be quite toxic and can require quite a period of time, we need to try and ensure that it is, it is patient focused and that there is a nice network, much as Michaela is developing to have the DMD hubs so that all of these patients are getting access to the therapy islands and islands or, or, or down, down in London. So I think it's trying to um, try and simplify the process, try and link in with the NHS as early as possible. And I suppose the other thing where we're well aware that there is a bottleneck is, is to be mindful of NHSBT or SMBTS because they are, they've got a limited resource and limited capacity as well. I know not so much for the gene therapies, but for cell therapies. So it, we need to be thinking proactively about how we can be working with our colleagues, either supporting them to develop um, increased capacity or actually, is there a way that, that we can actually take that into the NHS trust so that we're not dependent upon our colleagues who, who've already got um, very, very busy clinical practice. Thank you. I was actually going to come to you because you mentioned you know, your, your network, the DMD network, and obviously, behind a network is a real collaborative spirit. Where do you think the advantage in having the, a, a network, both for patients and for clinical studies, and especially academic clinical studies? Yeah, I think that the, the, the big advantage is if the sharing of experience and the learning lessons. So it is, as it was mentioned so far, is, is a field that is evolving, but is also a field that is new. Uh, and I think that is important that what is learned from one experience is shared with the other side in order to speed in a way the process has allowed uh, a, a more um, collaborative approach, but also to allow 
centers to um, be able to deliver gene therapy. Within our network, the other advantages of having a network in this, in this context is the fact to create an infrastructure to reach out and ensure that one of the needs that we were highlighted today was the, the, need, the, need, the need of training. And the training is a different level. So it's the training of the clinician, but it's, it's the training of uh, uh, the nurses involved, the, uh, the people involved in the setting up of a, a gene therapy study or an advanced therapy uh, uh, study, which is different compared to other type of, tri uh, of studies. And I think it's important that having uh, the ability to share experiences, provide training material has really speed, I think, the, in general, the process. And we have already seen this from one study to another. Um, the network has also, in a way, allowed us to make uh, the voice, in a way, stronger in general about what, where are the needs and what are the issues that different sites are mm -hmm. uh, developing. So mm -hmm. one of the, I think, the limitation in, an action that we should work on is to harmonize the assessment of advanced therapies from a regulatory point of view. We have experienced for the first few clinical trials that each single site has different assessment, different point of view, different safety concern, different um, uh, procedure to be put in place um, when actually in harmonization would actually support site maybe with less experience, but also reassure in a way to have a, a strategy um, develop for that perspective. And uh, the other thing that obviously having the network on the other end also facilitate the fact that you create the infrastructure that attract the um, pharmaceutical company to in a way come to the UK and have access not to one side, but to a large group of sites and therefore a larger group of patients, even if in the context of neuromuscular diseases, we are talking about um, rare diseases. So these are things that we have definitely experienced and they allow us really to develop uh, a model uh, that then can be um, for to develop. And the last thing is that I think that is important to think about that we are talking about advanced trials in, with advanced therapies. But the, the aim of trials is obviously to reach to the point where we will have a product that are licensed and can be implemented in clinic. And these work need to go in parallel and should never happen one after the other. So while we are sharing the experience in clinical trial, we also need to think about how can this be implemented if obviously will be implemented in an NHS setting. And I think that for that perspective, we need to be um, careful, and they agree that uh, is the more likely situation is where we'll have central, uh, large centers able to deliver advanced therapies. On the other end, if we do not create the training and the awareness of uh, uh, the concern around or the, the safety and uh, um, requirement around advanced therapy more globally, will be difficult to ensure that a large number of patients will have access to advanced therapy, either in clinical trial or in a clinical setting. And this is the model that for which within our network we are discussing about, for example, a bespoke model where the training about the requirement and the safety monitor are disseminated to a larger group of sites compared to the one that deliver gene therapy to create a little bit the infrastructure to uh, deliver nationally. I'm um, mindful that we're running out of time, but the other panel members who haven't spoken yet, are there any other particular barriers that you that you would like to bring up just now before we move on to the next question? Peter? Yeah, maybe just the problem that we have experienced um, with manufacturing and particularly manufacturing at affordable levels for academic-led clinical trials and there's been a lot of talk about this and, you know, I was delighted to see that the MRC as, and, and Life Arc recently invested into the three hubs that are specifically um, asked to manufacture cost effectively for, uh, for academic and clinical trials. And I think that's, you know, once they get up and running, probably going to make significant impact for academic research. on to the next question um, 
Um, Bishan, if we could come to you, um, if you don't mind. Um, thinking about COVID, um, as somebody that's just recovering from COVID, um, it's brought some disadvantages, but it's also brought some advantages. It's, it's shown how amazing the NHS is. It's shown how flexible the regulators may be able to be. Have you experienced any uh, acceleration through you know, the, the time of COVID? And what do you think we could bring to the ATMP field going forward from it? So thank you very much. So um, we experienced this firsthand with uh, the Monaco study. So this study proposed to um, instigate um, tissue remodeling monocytes for resolution of fibr lung fibrosis after COVID. Um, we had worked for a number of years with this therapeutic product for a different indication to promote collateralization in the in the leg and when we saw that they may have antifibrotic properties we we sought out to repurpose them um, we started with some institutional funding um, to to instigate that and actually to see how quickly things would be that could be done was a revelation i think of the space of something like eight months it was instigated the patient recruitment was completed and we're now in the follow-up phase um, so, so what can we learn from that? The, the sort of take home messages from that for me were working with people that really deeply understand the process, who've, and this comes back to skills and training, who've been trained from the ground up. So they, they, they learned how to actually interact with the MHRA, with R&D, how to circumvent the inevitable questions that arise. Um, so that I think has accelerated things um, um, very well. The, the team that took it on um, really understood that well. I think uh, um, directing resources in the right uh, uh, place, um, I think one thing that COVID allowed was that things unfortunately shut down so that resources could be directed to a few specific areas and that really did accelerate things. And then flexibility with the MHRA, the ability to have this conversation with them to say, look, you know, these cells we've already injected in patients, we're just using these for a different indication. They are autologous. How much burden of proof in animal preclinical models do we need? You know, we have to keep it sensible as, as a sort of clinician approaching this as a clinician. I think it sort of needs to be a bespoke approach uh to each product um mm. uh, and there has to be that flexibility and, and ability to have an open conversation so I, th I think there's plenty of lessons to be learned there fantastic thank you i, I would agree absolutely and ellen you also mentioned that in the realist trial and you said that phase two was faster um and i, I wondered how much of how much of that was covid related and how much of it was your learning from realist phase one studies. Yeah, so we, we were ready to go with the phase two trial in a non-COVID population, I suppose that, um, that that is one thing. And certainly, so we were ready, we had all the systems in place. We had primarily run the phase one trial in, in one, one center, um, but we had everything ready at other uh, at other sites. But at that outset of COVID, um, uh, as, you, as was just pointed out, all of the resources were directed towards COVID related projects so as I said we were able then to rapidly then um, get all of the approvals that were required in terms um, of repurposing our trial and so we uh, there, that that um, restart of the trial in the COVID population it was phenomenal the fact that it, it took two weeks um, and I think a lot of that was the, the direction of resources and um, the fact that we were able to get overnight decisions on many of the approvals that were required um, and you know people were working all hours of the day to try and get that that um to 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 try and direct all of the resources towards the COVID project certainly when the trial got up and, and running and um, there was a, a level of learning that we had had from the phase one trial as well that had built up the other thing was we were able to expand across a number of sites um and, and i suppose part of that was because with, with the focus on research and entering people into clinical trials through COVID, and um, sites had an interest in in joining us as well um, 
and we have then been able to carry that experience and that extra um, um, those extra sites, for instance, through into then our next phase two trial, which that hadn't been original originally planned for us. So it was another advantage. Um, so I, I think that um, and similar to the other phase one trials, phase two trials going on in other, con other conditions and other clinical conditions, there, there certainly is a, a learning element from the process of running the trial. Um, and as a few of the other panelists ha have um, pointed out, um, I think we can we can all learn a lot from each other in running those those clinical early phase trials. Um, and that's going to be important then for phase for scaling up into the phase three trials, which I think is important in this field. If we're going to be able to advance these therapies and expand them out into the NHS. I think we do need to be able to, to take that next step into, into phase three trials, certainly in the in the area of cellular therapy. Um, it sort of leads me into what I was going to ask next. Um, and Francesca, I'm, I'm going to come to you because you've not had the chance to, to answer yet. But do you think we're adventurous enough? You know, if we're going into phase three, do you think we are still so young in our development pathway that we should be quite cautious and, and build that deep understanding that uh, Bajan mentioned? Or do you think we should actually, because these are quite often rare indications, very small patient groups, we should be looking at adaptive trial design and really pushing the boundaries? You know, where do you think the balance is? Francesca? I couldn't understand if you were asking me. Oh, well, I have to say I'm probably the least uh, qualified person to answer to this question. That's why I was a little bit uh, in uh, in uh, in doubt. And I will what I will do. I will I will uh, ask. Uh, let's say Bijan if he wants to comment. But I was keen to say something. And given that I have the floor for a moment. Um, I think we need to do something. Uh, I, I looked recently at the data on the clinical trial Gov, and uh, if we look back at uh, 2020, let's say, um, uh, UK had uh, 48 uh, trials in gene therapy and Germany had around uh, 23, France 34, uh, London 39, so London alone had more than France. And now it's different. September 2021, the um, UK has 94 trials in uh, gene therapy, and Italy, who didn't even appear on the map years ago, has 94. And uh, so all the other countries have managed to increase their activities there, while we, we, we increased it, but um, at a much slower rate. And for cell therapy trials, we, we are really lacking behind. We have 40. 455 actives and Spain has 579, Italy 542 and Germany 800. So I just wanted to make a comment in this way, but for uh, you know the, how we should manage the clinical trials, I think I'll, I'll ask someone more qualified than me, Michaela, Bijan, say something, <laughs> get me out. <laughs> this is a difficult question. <laughs> Just before we move on, I think we've got to look at the data because we do a lot of data analysis at Catapult and we, we launch a, a clinical trial database each year. There's a real variation in what people include in a clinical trial and there can sometimes be trials included in more than one category. So sometimes it can be an elevation of data. So just a, a caution on that. Um, yeah, no, no, we absolutely, we, we made sure we did the same search over the years. So, you know, if, if we had the same bias, so to speak. So I'm sure those are not the absolute and correct numbers, but we have the same error over the years, so to speak. So the trend, the trend is worrying rather than the absolute numbers. So over the year, other countries have managed to increase much more than we did, uh, aside from the, you know, absolute numbers. That's, that's the overall message. And now I will really ask my schoolmates to get me out of a difficult question from the teacher. Okay, so Bajan, Michaela, Bajan, you've come off. So would you like to answer the question? Actually, you know, I've been so focused on Francesca that I forgot what the question was. Can you just t tell us that again? I was saying, have we been adv adventurous enough? Should we spend time being cautious or should we go for much more adaptive trial designs? You know, trying to be quite... Um, at the forefront of how we move the clinical trial landscape on. So, so, so I think there's a tension here, isn't there? Because if if you apply for the traditional type of funding, there you almost have to be cautious to, to some extent. But I firmly believe that 
we should be less cautious. Um, I think the trial design is really important. So increasingly, we are using adaptive trial design. I think it's important to talk to experts about trial design so that we can convince people that there's going to be a meaningful readout after you do the clinical study. Because I think there is some skepticism uh, from funders from time to time as to whether this huge amount of funding is going to give them an answer. And I think, you know, there needs to be a mixture of, um, you know, opportunistic sort of risk take, taking type of funding and the traditional academic funding to give us the answers. And for that, I think we need, you know, to be supported better in, in securing things like IP for proposed products, which will then allow us to go out there and get that funding. So I think in short, I would support, um, you know, to some extent, a riskier approach to, to propel, you know, the, the opportunities that we have in the UK. But with that has to come excellent support for sort of novel trial design and leveraging the um, all the sources of funding that we possibly have in the UK. And the network, I think, is really important for that. We all need to learn from each other when it, when it uh, comes to that, not just sit in our isolated institutions. Um, so, yeah. Absolutely, share more. Um, Michaela, would you like to add anything to yeah. that? Um, no, I feel agree that the sharing experience and we need to really look into the, the sharing outside a specific field. So is between different disciplines, we can still learn from each other. And I think that we, we are doing this, but we, we should do it even more. Uh, and this is really an aspect that is about study design, but is about uh, safety is about accelerating the uh, the, the approval in, in the regulatory process. So I think that that will really make a difference. Then between being uh, cautious or being more um, uh, adventure is obviously is, is a different call. At the end of the day, you need to be, uh, as a clinician, I would say always you put the patient safety. So is how much adventure, but we need to consider, first of all, I think, that uh, I agree that we need to move out of the standard study design um, uh, protocols and be more inventive for that perspective and look into other uh, way to test. We need to consider that some of these uh, uh, therapies and I'm specifically talking about a gene therapy for now at least, and there is a question about it, is about is one offer for the patient. So you, you do not have time to assess and then try again and then try again. But how do you do that? I mean, so for me, is work that we need to do in terms of trial design for that perspective being more adventure, but also investing in try to understand about um, endpoint, original, let's say, endpoint or biomarkers that can indicate us whether we are going in the right direction uh, without waiting years and years of clinical experience. So the two things need to be to move together. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm mindful that we've only got a minute left. Um, the message I've got from what we've been talking about all through the talks and this panel discussion is collaboration is happening, it's growing, um, and I think that's fantastic. I think we need to make much more of that. There needs to be, an event. And unfortunately, Uta had to leave. I wanted Uta to talk about you know, training and uh, it's the London Advanced Therapies and the Advanced Therapy Treatment Centre Network have spent quite a lot of time trying to do a lot more training. So I think the training, the consolidation of, of knowledge, but that knowledge doesn't need to be reinvented. If the collaboration works, we can all share, which is fantastic. Flexibility, whether that be the regulators, whether it be the NHS, whether it be developers, I think they're all key. Um, and management of resources from it be your research research nurses up to space in your liquid nitrogen, whatever it might be, all of those. But can I just ask each of the panel members, if you, and we are running out of time, so apologies for people who have to leave, but let, let's try and do this. If you were given um, anything that you think that would help academic trials move through the pathway quicker, what would you choose was the number one thing to focus on? Um, Bishan, you're, you're now at the top of my list, so can I come to you first? Uh, for me, it is skills and training. 
Um, so we need the key opinion leaders and the innovators of the future that will then propel other people behind them. So I think we need to invest in dedicated training programs in a multidisciplinary way to bring this cohort of people, as I said, that deeply understand the whole process because it's them that will have the ideas. It's them that will deal with the regulators. It's them that will bring the whole team behind them. So I think if we don't do that now as a network, we've got this really great opportunity as a network to instigate this, then we won't realize our full potential. So skills and training and investment in skills and training. Fantastic, thank you. Michaela. Um, I actually agree is skills and training, and but I would expand to skills and training that is, yes, really with academics, but is really institutional training and readiness. So is also with the regulator, is also with NHS, and we, the two things need to really work now. Fantastic. Victoria. Yeah, I'd echo what my colleagues have said. So I would say skills and training in the R&D, but also um, within the NHS. And as everybody says, it's an opportunity. So to have a collaborative approach and actually bring together some of these people who are leaders of the field to, to, to share their experience and their the, 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 the troubles that they've hit so that people coming behind won't hit those. And actually, if you could have a streamlined process, that will make it much, much easier because as you say, in R&D, this feels like a no-brainer and you can see the NHS can do it when they ruled out the vaccine study. So I saw on one of the comments kind of, can we build on that? And there is that that sort of says, look, there is the momentum, look what you can do and how quick you can do it. Um, but it is just trying to make it um, ensure that, that that training and that knowledge comes through and that people can make it as simple as possible to allow it um, to be mainstream. Yeah, thanks. Um, I would very much agree with Victoria that I think the ex, um, infrastructure within the NHS is going to be very important for scaling up cellular therapy. Um, I think it, it, delivering it locally at sites throughout the UK, I think in order to do that, um, the, the infrastructure needs to be there. And of course, in order to facilitate that and to facilitate trials, I think funding and um, in an ideal world, dedicated funding to cellular therapy and gene therapies would be would be great to see as well. And with that, I'm going to thank all the panel members and I'm going to, for all your contributions, it was fantastic. I'm going to hand back to Francesca. Well, thank you, Jacqueline. And uh, uh, just one second to add, uh, um, when I asked this question to the London community a few months ago, they said uh, that uh, training and infrastructure, but also a permanent staff that is not linked to a grant for, for a specific trials to have uh, uh, research nurses, uh, QCC, uh, quality assurance that are permanent members of staff and then can really support so that the productivity doesn't go a peak and then uh, waiting until you apply for the next one. But we are overrunning. I, I have to thank everyone. It was a, a fantastic meeting and uh, it, it really speaks to the importance of collaboration, sharing information and working together to make sure that uh, we progress and we uh, really retain uh, and uh, enhance UK uh, competitive edge in this field. Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely evening.